All participants are going to receive a post-event survey to complete after the call, and we will share the video replay link once it's available. I will now turn it over to Amy Obenoffer, Director of Community Development Market Management at Citizens to introduce our speaker today. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you this afternoon? I'm pleased to be with you here today for the final session of our financial empowerment series. Citizens is committed to financial empowerment throughout our communities in a variety of ways, including financial contributions, volunteer time, and educating our customers, colleagues, and communities. This year alone, we've committed $1.5 million to financial empowerment programs across our footprint, and our colleagues are the ones who bring these programs to life, and we are forever grateful for that. We are so lucky to have subject matter experts here at the bank who are willing to share their time and expertise to help you make informed financial decisions. Today's session, Managing Debt, will wrap up our series, which has also covered retirement planning and financing higher education. Following today's presentation, you will receive a link to our sessions, which will also be on YouTube. I am delighted today to introduce our host and my good friend, Lisa McGraw, uh, the, I'm sorry, our retail banking director for New York. She brings a wealth of knowledge around personal finance, and today she's going to focus on managing debt, including understanding debt, debt reduction strategies, and what to do when you find yourself in debt, especially if it is unexpected. I know you'll find the information presented extremely helpful, and I know Lisa would be happy to answer any questions as well following her presentation. With that, Lisa, thank you so much for being here, everyone, and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Amy. I'm really excited to be with everyone today. I do have to course correct my very best friend, Amy Obenhofer, and I'll tell you a funny story because I want this session to be engaging and I want to hear from you and I want you to chat and engage. But when Amy got married, she decided as part of her vows to tell her husband that he was going to be her best friend. And I had to stop the wedding to remind her that I was her best friend because many years ago, um, Amy actually really helped me when I was young in my career. Um, she used the word empowering, but she really helped um, springboard my career and helped me reach what I'd like to think is part of my potential because I'm still working to get better every day. And so I'm gonna test everyone's chat capability because this session is all about you. I'd love to just hear before we get started <clears throat> what you want to get out of today's session. And my co-host, Olivia Ross, is going to make sure that I'm accountable for delivering all of that to you. So I'd love for you to just chat in. What do you hope to get out of today's session? Wow, it's a slow chat group. Okay, best ways to consolidate debt. I'm positive we're going to do that today. And I'll see if make my debt work for me. I'm going to give you a, 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 a tip that will help that. So I'm confident we'll get there. Save money. So important. Um, tools I can give my clients. Amazing. Okay, Olivia, I think we're going to get started. And so if we can just roll the slides. Um, I feel comfortable in sharing with you that we'll be able to get to all those things that you have in chat. So here's what I think is the most important thing about debt is really understanding what debt is. So thinking through like, what's the difference between credit and um, thinking about who do you owe? How much do you owe them? What are the payments? When are the payments due? And then the other thing I would share with you in, is, is the payment a minimum payment? Are you actually hitting the principal and reducing the debt or are you doing an interest only payment? All of those things are really critical to know. And then you just have to really understand like what's the difference between debt and credit and debt is the money that you owe, right? It's money you've already used. It's money you already put into motion. And credit is sort of your ability to borrow money and understanding how to keep your credit in a good space can also help you 
it's as important, right, as understanding all of the things that I just covered around debt. And so I would share with you one of the things that I find is most helpful in understanding my debt is absolutely the interest rate, but it's also any sort of hidden fee. I also look for ways with everything that I do to see if there's a way that I can get some sort of discount. And what I mean by that is, does my creditor offer a rewards program? Does my person that I borrowed from have an incentive to get my statement or make my payments online? Like really understanding the details of all of those things will help you. And I think the other thing, speaking of details, that is really important to know is, are there any penalties fees for getting to the the contractual terms of a loan, such as prepayment penalties? Or if you pay your loan off early, is there a balloon payment for actually paying the debt off soon? Like you really have to know the rules of engagement to make sure you don't other that to make sure you don't overpay. Other things you should or other ways you can sort of really understand your debt is look at your credit report. Um, I, 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 I bank at Citizens because I've been here for 33 years. And even if I didn't work here, I would bank here because I use all of our products. And what I really love is when I use our, our credit card site, it will send me what my credit score is and it will actually tell me what I need to pay attention to to strengthen my credit card. Sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes it'll tell you you're spending too much. I don't necessarily love that message. I mean, I kind of do because it gives me a wake up call that I need to go back and understand my debt. Um, but you should really also think about all the tools that companies have out there that can really help you with this so that it doesn't feel like you have to do all these things for yourself. So I want to engage you. I would love to hear from you guys. Like debt can be either a really good thing when you have it under control, or it can be really overwhelming when it, when you feel like it's managing you. So I'd love to hear from you. How is debt impacting you today? And how does debt sort of impact your financial situation? Because that feedback from you will help us make sure we deliver a good session. And as a reminder, you can use the chat function in the bottom right. You can select to everyone or to all panelists or to our host, Lisa, directly, whatever your preference. Okay, well, I wait for some chats. I, I will just share with you that I have not always been debt savvy. Um, so I grew up um, with a single parent, my mom, she's a rock star. Um, but when we came to the United States, my mom was the provider for our family. And my mom was a really hard worker. And I learned a lot of lessons from her. Like I watched her start credit and we'll always be thankful to this one store McCurdy's that gave my mom her first credit. Um, and that's how she built up sort of understanding how to have credit. Um, and I also watched my mom on occasion feel overwhelmed by debt. And I could remember as a child sort of watching my mom sort of pick and choose or prioritize which debt was a must do that she had to pay. And from watching her do that, I said, gosh, you know, I'm going to work really hard one to make sure that I have good credit but I'm gonna work really hard to make sure that I don't have to make those choices. And so there was a time growing up when I was young and I got my first job and I was in college and I got credit cards and I have to tell you, I got in trouble. I spent money on these cards because it was easy. Um, and I went on some great vacations and I probably bought some things that I didn't need and I got a little overwhelmed with debt. And so I've been all over the spectrum. I'm happy to say that I've taken the lessons from this course and I'm in a much better space now, but I, I didn't see anything in chat. So I thought I would just share with you, like, I totally get it. I've been in a space where I felt overwhelmed by that. And then I've been in a space where I feel like today, I feel like I have complete control over how I acquire debt and what I do to reduce debt. So I think we'll move on. And I think one of the things that is most important 
is understanding how you incur debt. And, and sometimes like what happens that um, people get into debt or find themselves feeling either in control or overwhelmed. And so we purchase assets, right? We buy things. And some of those things are necessities like the place where we live or the car that we drive or the school that we um, go to. Those are all assets. Um, because even though it's debt, right, there's still a value that's associated with getting a degree or having a home or having a car. Um, we pay bills and we pay them because if we don't pay them, there's a consequence. Um, and one of the things that I will share with you is sometimes there will be a time where you can't afford to pay a bill. And the mistake that I sometimes people, I think the mistake I see people make with their bills is they pay one bill with another form of debt. And so it's interesting, but I, I, I was a banker. So I, I saw in chat, someone wanted help in helping their customers. And the best way that you can help your customers is really get your customer to avoid robbing Peter to pay Paul. And what I mean by that is sometimes folks will take that 0% interest because it's gonna give you 0% for a year and they'll pay one bill by acquiring more debt. And if you don't take a minute to really look and see what are the bills that I have, and you just keep moving it from card to card to card to card, you're never gonna get ahead. And so really understanding your bills and really understanding what you're paying each month and what you owe will help you avoid that mistake of transferring debt from one bill to another. And sometimes life happens, right? Um, we were chatting before this call started, my furnace decided not to work anymore. And since it was snowing where I lived yesterday, that was not a really good thing. And so that emergency, I did not see coming, right? That's a debt that I now have that came from a place of emergency. And then we're all people and we all want things, right? And so there's something we see, like I was watching Amy before this meeting started and she had this beautiful necklace on. So of course I'm like, wow, that's a really gorgeous necklace. And that would look really great with something I have. And then that creates this you know, thought in my head that I want that. And so I'm gonna share a tip with you later about how I manage my wants because I sometimes worry that I have too many of them. And then there's just things that you need like food and shelter and you know, going to the doctor. Um, sometimes there's unexpected needs. You might have uh, to go to the, uh, the urgent care and that's gonna generate a bill. You might be really sick and you have to be transported to a hospital that creates a bill. So these are sort of why we get into debt or why we accumulate debt. But these are also the things, right? We can learn to control so they don't overwhelm us. Okay. So um, one of the things that I will share with you that I sometimes do with thinking about my debt, like when I think about how am I going to, as in this example, pay for a furnace, I keep a list of the things that I would like to have. And I would think, and I have a list of the things that I absolutely have to have. And so in order to pay for my furnace, as an example, I now have to prioritize that because I have to have that. And then the things that I'm thinking about that I'd like to do, I have to wait to do those so that I don't overwhelm myself by taking on too much debt. I will also tell you one of the things that I do is I look at some of the things that I might have bought in the past six months. And this is not a plug for Citizens Bank credit card, but I will share, I'm an active user. I love the rewards that I get from it. But what I love most is I can have a summary of where I'm spending. And I make it a point once a quarter to look and see, am I buying a lot of things that I need? Or am I buying a lot of things that I want? And I really take a minute to see where I'm spending my money so that I'm not accumulating debt that isn't really contributing to peace of mind. And then I'll share with you some strategies that are on here and then we'll take a, a, a deeper dive, look at them. But the first strategy you have to have for reducing debt is what we call high cost debt first, right? It is about, it's just like I learned from my mom, right? My mom prioritized the electrical bill because we had to have electricity, right? She 
prioritize what we needed to pay for food because we had to eat. You have to prioritize your debt. You have to look for those creditors that have the highest interest rate and the highest balances. And you want to make sure that that's the debt you're trying to chip away at first. And then the other piece is snowball method. Like sometimes we we have 10 bills that we're paying and maybe we owe $50 here and $75 there. And if you want to gain peace of mind and control over your debt, sometimes you just have to pay off the debt that you can just so that you're paying less bills and you start to feel like you have control over what you're doing. I will tell you my number one, my number one tip to you, and I hope that you will write this down. I have two tips for you. One is you have got to have an amazing banker that gives you very good advice about the way you're moving financially. And so even though I am a banker, I have someone who gives me advice about the way I'm moving because sometimes when you want something, you're gonna move, you're gonna get it. It might not be the best thing for you. And you want a banker who might say you need to slow your spending, or you might think about using the equity in your home. Um, and I will just tell you a, a really honest story. When I grew up, I grew up very poor. My mom did not have a banker. And I was fortunate enough to participate in this J junior achievement program in my high school. And part of it was you had to go to a bank and meet a banker. And you had to learn about financial empowerment. You had to learn what banks could offer you that could give you peace of mind. Now, mind you, I lived in a neighborhood where there was no bank. So I can remember telling my parents that I had to go um, to this to this bank and it was like a mile from our house. And, you know, I grew up with parents who were like, listen, we walked 10 miles to school in a hurricane with no shoes on and a snowstorm was happening. And they're like, well, you're just going to have to make that happen. And so I remember I walked for a mile and, you know, you're a kid. I'm like, I don't really know how this is going to go. And I met this banker at HSBC on Lyle Avenue in Rochester, New York. And she changed my life in so many ways because she helped me open my first account. She showed me all the reasons why I wanted to be a, a bankable customer, a customer who has credit, who has, um, who has um, access to knowledge. Like, and the one lesson she told, told me that I would ask you write this down, you have to pay yourself first. You have to pay yourself first. You have to think about how you're building a savings so you always have peace of mind against debt. And um, I will tell you, when I met with her, I'm like, I work part-time. Like, I make $50 a week. And she said, well, we have a free savings account. And if you save $10 from your $50 that you make a week, in a year, you're going to have $500. And, you know, a long time ago when I was that age, $500 was a whopping amount of money. And I listened to my banker. I found a way to make it happen. She sat down with me and she showed me how I could carve $10 out to pay myself first. And it really changed my, my life. It also, when I left her, I felt so much more confident about my future that I said, you know what, I'm gonna do that for a living. I'm gonna be that Kathy at HSBC. And so I see a chat question, so I'm gonna take that question. You do not have to have a banker to sit with you, to show you all the ways they can help you, to look at where you are and give you suggestions on how to make it better. That is a banker's job. That is the best part of being a banker is sitting with customers and helping them walk away, feeling like they have some control over their finances. And Myra, I don't know you, I don't know where you live, but you can find a way to, to connect with me and I can recommend a good banker who would love to do that for you. So Olivia, you know, I'm very passionate about the pay yourself first thing, but I think we should give to get to the next slide to sort of show what a snowball debt method might look like. So when you're using the snowball, snowball method, right, which will eliminate debt faster, um, it, it doesn't necessarily maximize your, maximize your savings. So paying the highest interest debt off first will ensure you're not paying interest rates that are high over time. But the key to this method is to really think about what's important to you, right? Are you stressed out about how much interest you're paying 
or are you stressed off out about the amount of debt that you owe? And again, this is this snowball debt method is really about understanding the details of the debt. And I'll give you an example. I can remember, um, and, and my mom's ears are probably burning right now, but I can remember a time that my mom got sick and her insurance didn't cover everything that was um, medically, she was medically responsible for. And I was going to the bank, walking a mile to HSBC to make my deposit. And I was talking to Kathy because she always checked in on me. And I told her my mom had this medical bill and it was a little stressful. And she gave me such great advice that I would have never thought about because I was 16. And so she said, you should call the hospital and you should ask them to work out a payment plan for you because often, right, they don't know your situation and they don't charge an interest rate and they'll let you carry it out over time. And so my mom and I called the hospital, we got the details and we sort of used this method to sort of prioritize like that, even though it was probably her most significant debt, it had no interest rate. And the hospital wasn't going to punish her if it took her 10 years to pay it off, whereas some of her credit cards debt was higher interest rates and she wasn't gaining any, any traction. So I have to tell you, my buddy Kathy at HSBC showed us and helped us understand by what was important to us and what might be causing us stress. She helped us come up with a plan for which debt we wanted to tackle first. And then the other method, right, is here. It's, it's about if, if what stresses you out is the interest rate and you feel like you're not making any progress because the interest rate is leading you to only making that minimum payment and you're only paying the interest, then you have to look at your debt and say, okay, I have this credit card at 14%. I have this medical bill at 10,000%, at 10%. My car loan's not that bad at 6%. I may want to look at my my funds, what I have to spend on my debt and my prioritization, right? If it's important to me to eliminate high cost debt first is to make extra payments where I can on that credit card. The other thing that I will tell you that I've learned from applying these two methods or thinking about these two methods to come up with a strategy to get rid of debt is if I had a credit card at 14%, which I will tell you, there was a time that I, I thought it was really important to go on this vacation that I couldn't afford. And I, I took a really stupid credit card that had a really high interest rate and I just wasn't getting anywhere with it. And so I talked to my banker, Kathy, and she shared with me options and she showed me ways that I could get rid of that debt at a lower interest rate. And I have to tell you what felt like was going to take me forever to pay off. I got rid of in two years. So I will tell you from personal experience, either method works, but you do have to really think about what your motivation is and what's important to you. I'm going to pause and see if anyone has any questions as we move into the best part of uh, debt management, which is prepayment. So let's pause and see if anyone has any questions that they want to chat in. Okay, either you guys are really shy or I'm boring you. And I hope I'm not boring you because we're going to be together for another half an hour. All right, Olivia, let's keep rolling. So prepayment is an amazing thing, right? And that's when you're able to repay all or part of your loan. And when you prepay, right, you're paying the lender more than what you owe and they're applying that extra amount to your outstanding balance. And so you really start to make progress on your debt. And so prepayment is an amazing strategy um, that will help you reduce the cost and um, the money and, and the expense of what you owe. It also helps you feel like you're taking control of your um, situation, right? When you're starting to prepay, you feel like you're setting the world on fire because you can start to see the progress. And one of the things that, um, and I, I, I should, you should charge me a dollar for every time I say Kathy's name. Um, but one of the things she had me do to help educate me on debt was she would have me bring my bills in month over month so I could see, right, the interest reduction just by prepaying. And I have to tell you, it motivated me 
to try to do whatever I could to prepay a little more. And so I would do little things that like, I would make my own coffee. Um, I would, um, not go out for lunch. I would pack my lunch. Uh, and it really made me start to think about, like, I love shoes. And I, and so I would think, do I really need those shoes or do I really want to get rid of this credit card debt? Cause if I wasn't paying that interest, I could buy two pairs of shoes. And so the one thing you do have to make sure you understand, and I mentioned this earlier, is you also have to make sure that the debt you're paying off or prepaying isn't going to penalize you for doing that. There are some lenders um, that do build in to the offer that if you prepay, there's a penalty. And Louisa, I love your question. I know a million Kathy's that work in my market, and I know a lot of good bankers out there. Um, and so I will tell you, it, sometimes you, you could go into bank and you might not find that person who really understands what a privilege it is to be a banker. Um, but I, I don't know where you live, Louisa, but I could hook you up with a Kathy. I'm sitting actually in front of two Kathys right now, two bankers who actually do an incredible job of giving people advice. And I would say if anybody needs help around this subject offline, I would be willing to help anyone because, again, I, I shared with you earlier, I know what it likes, feels like to have debt, um, and I don't want anyone to have those feelings. And so, Louisa, you must have known what our next slide was because I also want to share with you some other options um, that can really help you get at managing debt and alleviate any stress you have from it, right? So we have debt settlement companies, and those um, companies – um, can help you develop a plan to manage your own debt. Um, and so you can find those companies by just Googling credit counseling. And you'll start to see a lot of nonprofits or organizations who that's their job is to help you get your arms around this. You can also go to www.usa.gov. It's GOV. But they have resources that give chips right from the Federal Trade Commission on how to find and choose a credit counselor. And I will tell you, Louisa, sometimes you have to pick and choose the person until you get the person that you click with. The, um, the first time I opted to, to pay myself first and, and try to start um, to do some investments, the first advisor I met with, Louisa, he was like buttoned up. He was a little boring. I hate to say that. He didn't work at Citizens, by the way. Um, and, and we just didn't gel. And to be honest, I didn't really feel like he understood what was important to me. So I didn't invest with him. I went to two other financial advisors until I found someone that I just clicked with. And then I would say, right, you do have to be careful with debt settlement companies because you, you want to make sure you understand what their intention is and what they're all about because you don't want that to become another debt. And there are plenty of agencies who will help you with this without any cost to you. And then there are debt consolidation companies, right, who will provide you with a loan, who will consolidate um, your debt into one loan so that you can get to a space where you just have one payment at one interest rate. You know, you have one term. So you almost have like a start and an end date, right? So you know what you owe, you know how much you're gonna pay in interest and you know when it's gonna end. But you do have to be prepared to ask a lot of questions about what the interest rate is, if there's any fees, if there's any other sort of hidden cost, but your best friend in, in finding this or getting help with managing debt, and I'm not saying this because I work with a bank, with, at a bank, in a bank that I love, um, but your banker has, no interest, right, in, in giving you information that's not going to help you, but they are very knowledgeable about the communities that they work in, and often we work with Amy, who kicked off this call, and her team, and we partner with companies who specialize in financial empowerment and helping solve this that are nonprofit, but I would start with a banker that you trust, and I would make sure that you have all of the details about what you're getting yourself into and feel good about it. But these are great options to help you help yourself get out of debt and make it more manageable. And so um, I will ask that we keep moving, Olivia. And I'm just going to look and see if we have any questions in chat, Olivia. 
Yes, it looks like we've got one on this topic. Um, yep. Lori I, I is see. hoping that you can, yeah, clarify the difference between debt management companies and debt settlement companies. I will. So that's a great question, Lori. Thank you. And so a debt settlement company, usually for a fee, will offer to represent you with all of the people that you owe debt to, and they'll come up with uh, an arrangement to settle that debt. And, and, and there is normally a fee for it. But sometimes it's like if you had a mortgage that you couldn't pay. There are companies out there called debt settlement companies that will help you exit that mortgage in in home situation. They charge a fee, but they sort of advocate and represent you and work with all of your the people that you owe money to to come to one settlement. And a debt consolidation company actually helps you settle your debt on your own. So they take all of your debt and put it into one loan at one term and one expense so that you are paying back the debt, the true debt that you owe. They sort of consolidate your debt into one package for you. So Lori, before I move on, I wanna make sure that that makes sense and it answered your question. Okay, uh, we're gonna assume that it does because I don't wanna run out of time and I'm a little chatty. Um, and if Loria doesn't, you just tell us again that it, it didn't hit the mark and we'll go back to it. Um, so I do think it's kind of important to understand sort of the life cycle of debt, which I'm sure sounds very riveting to all of you. But what it is, is, is the life cycle, cycle of debt is understanding the debt you're taking on and making sure, right, that it feels right for you. And then the next step in that cycle is paying on time and as agreed so you stay current, right? That's important to maintain your credit score. And then our favorite cycle of debt, at least my favorite cycle of debt, is paying it off because you just feel this sense of accomplishment when it's gone. Um, but sometimes it just does not work out like that. Like sometimes you just cannot keep your life cycle of debt current. So let's talk about what happens when life sometimes throws you a curveball and that life cycle of debt is not current, right? So picture a time, and, and I've been there, that you've taken on a debt and you fall behind on your payments or your debts are delinquent. If you continue, right, to miss payments or your debts are not being met, then that person who's holding that debt has the option to default. And for some loans, that could be as quick as missing one payment, which why it is so important when you do that first step of the life cycle, take on debt, you know all the rules of engagement. For other loans, they could it could be days, it could be weeks or months of non-payment before they move you through the cycle. But after default, some creditors will charge off your account and what they do, so when you are charged off, right, they give you to, to the next step in that cycle, which is probably the least pleasant step in the cycle, which is collections. And so um, once a debt goes to collections, right, the collector is taking on those charge offs because they're confident that they're going to get you to pay. And the not so pleasant part of that is they're often a little bit more aggressive, right, in their pursuit of getting back their, their, the debt because that's what they're buying. And so I'm going to see, get your perspective in chat. What do you think happens when you're in this not current cycle of debts and you don't settle your debts as they happen? What are the other things that could happen? Okay, you could take on more debt, your credit scores go down, you could get sued. Oh, Louisa, you get all those phone calls from the, the collection folks, right? And so, you know, there's not often a job that I say I wouldn't try or want to do, but I have to tell you, I don't know that I would ever want to be in collections. And so you guys are like brilliant. So we're going to go to the next slide and we're going to really, and it is so overwhelming. That is really for me, 
like it doesn't feel good to not be able to meet, you know, the things that you're thinking you're going to be able to do. But these are, and you nailed a lot of them in chat, these are the consequences of not paying debt, right? You get late fees, you could accumulate or spend more money in fees and interest. You get to talk to those fund debt collectors. You can lose your services, right? You could pay additional costs to reestablish those services. And on and in some cases, right, you could lose your collateral. So if one of the debts you didn't pay was your car, then that debt collector could come and grab the collateral that's securing the loan. And it's so funny because I, I often think about my mom when I think about, you know, she wasn't from the United States and here she is like in her head prioritizing the consequences of not paying debt. And there's just other things that you should think about. And you got one of them in chat. It drops your credit score. It's a negative entry on your credit report. You could get sued, which is not pleasant. Um, some credit, um, some collection agencies, some people you owe debt to can garnish your wages. Um, some of them can, you know, garnish funds owed from your account, or they can put holds on your account. And depending on the type of debt, they can even offset it through treasury, which means if, as an example, if you were getting a tax refund, they can find a way to go at it that way. And so there are a lot of consequences and unintended consequences of not paying as agreed. And so let's talk about like what happens though when you're in that cycle and you're not able to be current. I'm gonna share with you the biggest mistake that I see people make, like as much as you don't wanna talk to that person in collections, you have to talk to that person. So picture you trying to avoid them or you not taking their call, it's like pouring gas on a fire, right? And so uh, it's interesting, but at one point in my career, I sat in um, Rochester, Amy and I actually sat together and we sat next to the folks who run our auto finance area in collections. And one of the things that I was most proud of is we sa I sat by this one um, collector, his name was Paul. And when people actually, answered his call, he really went over his, he went out of his way to make sure the person understood every single thing that they could do to help the person. And so even though we have this perception in our head, myself included, that debt collectors are not the best people that you want to talk to, they are your contact in solving that situation. And so they're gonna contact you by phone or by email, pick it up. Make sure that they really are a true debt collector and that they really are who they say they are, right? They know who the creditor is, they have details, get it in writing. But once you're positive that you really are speaking to the debt collector, leverage that person, verify, right? You're gonna verify who they are, but then Ask them questions like, what is your recommendation? What can I do if I can't afford to pay what you're asking me? Let them know your intent is to do the right thing, but work with them and see if they're a resource that can help you. You should also know, right, if it gets into a situation where you're being sued, you can get legal help. And so if the debt collector is not one who is helpful and they say, we're going to sue you, Every community that I've ever been in has legal aid and it's often at no cost to you. And so you can go to the American um, Bar Association to find out who those advocates are for folks who can't afford to pay for legal help. And you can also, I mean, the website is amazing. You can just type in findlegalhelp.org and there's this whole website that can come up that can really help you understand all of the details of the lawsuit. They can make sure that you respond on time so that you don't accumulate additional debt, but they can really be your advocate. And you know, the one mistake that I often see people make when they're getting sued is they try to take it on their self or they try to respond independent of a lawyer. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I'm not a lawyer. I don't understand all the things that are in legal documents. And if there's someone who's going to help me at no cost to me and they're an expert, you have to just reach out and find that help and take it. 
And then the other thing um, the lawyer can help you with, that legal aid can help you with, is really understanding the statute of limitation. So what that means is how long by your state law, what's the length of time that this creditor can collect? Um, it varies from state to state, um, but it will also make you aware whether or not the situation is going to intensify or if you have some time to sort of get to a good space. And again, big fan of the internet, you can go to USA.gov and you can just type in consumer protection offices because there's a whole group of free expertise support out there that can really make sure you understand your state limitations. And then the last thing I would say is if even when you're in a, a space of debt being in collections or going sideways, look at your credit report and understand like how long is it going to be on your credit report? Make sure that what's on there is actually accurate. And um, all of this is done under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, right? So the government has this act in place to protect all consumers, whether they're current in their debt or they're falling behind in their debt. And so my guidance to you again is there's a, a ton of experts out there who can help you decipher a credit report and understand what it means. They can help you understand the statute of limitations, but they can also help you understand what it is that you need to do to recover your credit. And so we're going to keep going. And so we're going to talk about like now what happens, right? if you just can't pay in full. Like there is a time in everyone's life, whether it be about debt or commitments, where you bite off a little bit more than you chew. And understanding what your debt is and thinking about all the strategies we talked about earlier, at some point you have to keep it real and you might have to talk with someone who can help you see, right? That you're just not gonna be able to pay it in full. And that's where you have to leverage help in setting up a payment plan that you can afford. But that's also where, right, you could use either an eight that debt settlement agency, if it could be a possibility to help you negotiate a lower balance, or who can ask you for a paid in, who can ask you to get to a paid in full instead of a settled. And I'll give you a, an example. I had a really good customer who just got into a bad space with this creditor and every month they were just pummeling on fees and interest and charges. And every time they sent her a, a notification, they charged her for all of these things and it was all in her contract. So, you know, unfortunately she wasn't aware and, and she was just never going to be able to pay it. And the truth of the matter is it was almost like what she owed a good portion of it was just all fees. It wasn't really actually the debt that the comp or the money that the company gave her. And she used a debt settlement agency who was her advocate. She had to pay a fee for it, but they went back to the company and showed the company and I'll make the numbers up. You want Amy to pay $1,000, $700 of it is in fees. She's willing to pay 350. And often the companies will, will say, okay, that might be right for us. Or they might come back and say, well, we'll settle for 400. But that's how those agencies can help you when you just get to a space that you can't pay. You can set up a payment plan that you can afford, or you can no, no, help have someone help you negotiate a lower balance or settle with the creditor to terms that make sense for your life. And Olivia, I think we're gonna keep moving. And so um, I, I do also think it's important, right? Because you're at the mercy sometimes of the debt collector who's calling you, but there are rules of engagement that debt collectors have to follow. And you should also know that as much as it's our responsibility to repay debt, when we're having a tough time and we can't re repay that debt, there is a Fair Debt Collection Practice Act that governs um, federal standards that debt collectors must follow. And so you should know that even when all of us have been in a space where we might um, not be able to meet the debt, the debt collector cannot be abusive, they cannot be unfair, they cannot be deceptive. 
They can't demand that you meet with them on their terms. They can't call you at work. If you ask them not to call you at work, they can't threaten you. They can't threaten you or, you know, offer acts of violence. They can't be obscene and they can't use profane language. And many states also have additional rules protection for folks when they find themselves in a space where they can't pay their debt to protect you and to help you. And, you know, again, sometimes you're at the mercy of that debt collector. And I think it's a good thing for you to know, right? When you're talking to someone, nothing slows someone's pace down than saying, hey, Mr. Debt Collector, I want to ask you questions and I want to work with you but I won't work with you speaking to me in this way. And I also know, Mr. Debt Collector, that you're governed by the Fair, Debit, the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act, right? That will help that debt collector know that you're knowledgeable about how they have to treat you. And it helps you demand that level of respect that you deserve. Um, I would also say the state's attorney general, if you're getting someone who's not abiding by these rules, can help you hash out these situations. And so um, we'll, at, we'll open it up for questions as we go along, but um, I want to make sure we get through all of our content and we have like 10 minutes left. So Olivia, let's keep moving. So I want to talk specifically about student loan debt. And so um, this section about student loan um, you have does not uh, does not cover applying for student loans. And so if you're uh, considering applying for a new, new student loan, the best thing you can do is use the student aid um, government web website for information, right? You first want to understand what you're eligible for before you take on debt. And I will also tell you many banks, um, citizens included, has great student loan programs and can help you navigate the thoughts about student loans. But some people do take on loans to pay for training in our education, and they have to pay, pay, pay back those loans over time. And the money that you sometimes owe, owe on student loans, it's actually called student loan debt. And for some people, right, think about a doctor or think about anyone who has to pay for student loans on their own can be very overwhelming. Um, and sometimes, right, you're going to school and you're anticipating when you finish your education, you're going to earn um, a certain amount of money that's going to help you pay back that debt. And that doesn't always happen. And I can tell you, I had student loan debt and I did my first job did not uh, make me confident that I was ever going to pay it off. And I was able to work with someone who actually helped me pay it off relatively quickly. So what happens if you don't repay your student loans? It kind of works the same way, right? You will end up paying more fees and interest. They can garnish your wages. Um, your bank accounts um, can be garnished. And again, they can do treasury offset. And so my guidance to you, if you have student loans and you feel overwhelmed and you can't repay them, is sort of along the same lines as previous gui guidance. Really understand what your options are. And Olivia, if we move to the next slide, your options are really partnering with um, the two types of student loans that are out there, private student loans or federal student loans. And private loans are often made by banks, like our bank does private student lending, but a big portion of student loans go from the government. And so when it's time to start paying back your loans, you'll either deal with a lender if you went through the bank, or you'll learn, you'll deal with the servicer, like your student loan servicer. And so some of the things you should be thinking about during your student loan conversation or how you're mapping out how you're gonna pay it back is, is there a grace period? Which means do they, do they allow you, and I'm making this up, do they allow you a month to find a job so that you can pay it back? Is there a grace period in your deal? Is there a, a repayment plan? Is it a standard plan or are there other options? And the other thing you should think about is there an opportunity to restructure your payment based on income? Or is there an opportunity to extend it if you plan to further your education? And all of, um, so all of the details on federal student loans and loan repayment options are all available to you heavily on, the, on government websites. And so I would just say, if you're struggling 
to really pay back student loans, you'll really have to, to apply the same strategies we talked about earlier. Get the experts out there to help you and ask really good questions about the grace period. What's the repayment plan and what options do you have to restructure that payment if you haven't gotten that job yet that you were hoping to have? So let's talk about um, repayment plans based on income. And so there's a lot of repayment plans that restructure payments based on your income. Because if you think about it, your income is actually your ability to pay. And so some of the plans that are out there that can help you reduce your payments and overall the amount you're paying are revised pay as you earn plan. So that's sort of what we call repay. Um, and so what that plan does is if you earn more, you might revise your plan to pay more. If you earn less, you can revise your pay based on your ability to pay. We also have a, a pay as you earn plan and it's simple to repay with a few exceptions. You have to be a new borrower prior, you know, on or after October 1st, 2007. And you must have received a disbursement of a loan before October 1st, 2011. And that repayment plan period is 20 years. And then there's another option called IBR, which is the income-based repayment plan. And those payments are 10 to 15% of your discretionary income. So not your overall income, but your income after you meet your financial um, commitments. And payments are recalculated every year. And the outstanding balance is actually forgiven after 20 or 25 years depending on whether you're considered a new borrower and you may have to and you may have to pay income tax on the amount forgiven but these are all sort of options that are out there that are just helpful to know and the last one is just the income contingent repayment the ICR plan and this monthly payment will be the lesser of 20% of your discretionary income which is the income you have available to pay after you pay your bills and then you would pay a fixed payment over 12 years. And so I will share with you, there are so many rules and eligibility requirements. And to answer your question about where you get information, you go right to studentaid.gov. That website also has an estimator. So you can actually use this estimator to figure out what you can pay. And so I know that was a lot on student loans, but I do want to leave some time for questions. So we're going to keep moving. And um, I will share with you, you may um, at some point in your, your situation, you may have to think about forbearance and deferment. Forbearance is just a temporary postponement or reduction of payments as a result of financial difficulty. And a deferment is a temporary suspension of payments um, for specific situations. Um, one example of a deferment that is actually, we should all be proud of, but sometimes when you're in the military and you're deployed, we have deferment options for deployed um, veterans or active military members to help them with their situation and to not have them under stress while they're um, performing a, a, a wonderful duty for our country. And then I would sh share in the spirit of student lending, there are some instances where um, <clears throat> Olivia, if you could move the slide ahead, where we have loan forgiveness, cancellation of death, or discharge. And so often that can come about um, due to circumstance. There could be a public service loan forgiveness. There could be a closed school discharge. If someone's a teacher, there could be teacher loan forgiveness. If someone were disabled, there's disability discharge. And there are also discharge discharges due to death. And again, all of these details are on the student aid dot on the student aid website. And so here are two other things that I would um, offer up and how you take action to prevent default. It, it is, um, and that's back to that circle of credit. You can ask for a different payment due date, right? If the payment due date is all on the first, and that's stressful for you because you get paid bi-weekly, you can reach out and ask them to move that due date. You can ask for different repayment options, forbearance, deferment, loan forgiveness, loan cancellation, discharge, <clears throat> all options to prevent default. And the, and the last um, thing, and I sort of touched on it earlier, 
so I'm going to move through it a little bit quickly, is medical debt happens, right? You're not planning for it, and, and you have to have medical attention when you need medical attention because your health is a priority. When you get a medical bill, you should absolutely make sure it's valid. And if you can't afford it, you should work with that vendor, that medical agency to set up a, a payment plan. And we're going to keep moving, Olivia. Olivia. And when you do that, right, why do medical bills turn into medical debt? Is because they're not planned. We don't know how much it's going to cost to get healthy. Those expenses add up quickly. And I don't know about you who've gotten a medical bill, but it can be a little confusing. And so before I let you go, I do want to make sure I, I would love to hear from a couple of you. Of, of what are you going to do with all this knowledge? So we spent some time today really showing you all the things that you could think about to take control of your debt. What's the one thing you're going to do when you hang up to really feel like you could tackle this to the ground? Make a list. Amazing, Louisa. Good first start. Awesome. You have to know what your starting point is, right? To tackle it to the ground. I'm going to give you two other thoughts. Rewatch this video. Thanks, Louisa. I take that as a compliment. Write out all my debt, prioritize debt, really smart, set appointments with my clients, go over budget. Love it. There's that banker we all want. Love it. So I'm going to give you a couple of things to think about, right? So the one most important thing is find your Kathy. Find your Kathy and get a great banker that you click with, that you enjoy, that you look forward to talking to, but who's also going to be honest with you. They're going to say, you know what? You don't need that cup of Dunkin' every day. You need to pay yourself first. That is my other big ask of you, right? Pay yourself first. Have that savings set aside. If you pay yourself first, right, you'll never have that debt due to an unexpected emergency. And I do have to say, the last thing I will leave you with, pick a bank that is committed to the communities that they serve. And I'm going to share one quick thing about citizens with you. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of is you have to do, you have to deal with the bank that spells it all out up front. And citizens just introduced this product that everyone could bank with, and it's called our EverValue checking account. And we are going to take this account, my market in particular, and we're going to make sure every community understands how they can bank with transparency. So these account, this particular account will never have an overdraft fee. And customers will pay one fee every month, but they will never, ever pay any fee over that. It's an amazing account, and it's an account that I'm proud to take back to the neighborhood that I grew up with to really help people have a banker. Because for me, if I think about how I started my journey, um, if I hadn't met Kathy, I would have never had financial freedom. And it is the biggest gift as a banker we can give to everyone. And so I, I know we're over time, Olivia. We'll see if there are any other questions. But I want to thank you guys for all of your engagement and for hanging in those three minutes I took extra. But you guys were awesome. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. This has been a great session. Thank you for leading us today. Thank you to Amy for kicking us off. And thank you so much to all of our engaged attendees. As a reminder, we are going to send a replay, which I know, according to the chat, it looks like a few people will be keeping an eye out for. Um, and we will also be sending around a post-event survey. So thank you to everyone again. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.